Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions during the presentations, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentations. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I'd like to welcome everybody to the June 26th edition of Crop Talk, and this week we are going to be uh, concentrating quite a bit about, on the soybean crop. Uh, we haven't been uh, talking too much about soybeans lately, and I thought it'd be a good time for us to uh, look at the crop in general, see how it started off, see how things are going, and maybe some of the things we can expect over the next uh, you know, two to three weeks during the growing season here. So uh, Terry Buss uh, is uh, one of our farm production extension specialists and he uh, does a lot of work in soybeans and I thought it'd be good if he could uh, give us an update. So uh, I guess with that, we'll start with Terry and then I'll continue on afterwards with uh, a crop update. So uh, Laurie, if you want to turn it over to Terry, we'll get started. Okay, so I'm good to go? You bet, Terry. Right on. Okay, off we go. So soybeans 2019, uh, I'd say it's been a tough June. Um, it's been a tough start period to the season, but it's been a tough June. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's a time when we just need to look away. Uh, we need to be in our beans. June is a very important month for us, but it's been tough. And you know what? Soybeans look bad in June in Manitoba as a rule. So, I mean, we've got to remember that this is uh, uh, a, a moderate to quite a warm season crop. June is, it's unlike a lot of the cool season crops we grow when in June they do a lot and if things go right, they can look really nice. Soybeans as a rule have a number of issues in June. They're doing a lot of important stuff and they're under a lot of stress, even in a good year. But this year has been particularly challenging across the whole province. And I list some of the challenges we've had Uneven germination and emergence has been one of them. We've had difficulty uh, with seed getting stranded without adequate moisture. We've had some stand reductions from seed that's germinated, partially emerged and dried out. People have chosen in some cases to seed fairly deep to try and get around the problem. Having adequate moisture in the top two inches of the soil has been difficult. And traditionally, this is a more shallow seeded crop for us because we generally find that it has trouble coming up from depth. That's been an issue. Cutworms, another issue. I have never seen cutworms in soybeans like I have this year in my whole career. We've seen them before. Cutworms are pretty general feeders. I think this year was a wake-up call to us that they eat soybeans too. And so we'll be talking about the cutworms. That's something that I think we're coming to an end on. Uh, I do have some farm calls I have to do by the end of the week where I'm still looking at cutworms and soy out this way out here. But Still, uh, I think we need to talk about them now. Uh, slow growth, both our crop and our weeds. Our herbicide decisions have been complicated in soy because of the crop being so pokey. We're gonna look at the weather data, but I'll tell you right now, our crop is behind compared to last year. That shouldn't surprise anybody. Weed emergence has been slow. People have been wondering what they need to do on the weed control side. And now IDC, which is our, our yearly visitor has reared its ugly head. Um, it has, it's bad in some areas. It started off fairly intensively across a lot of acres. Out our way here in Beausager, I have fields that are quite yellow and I have others that haven't shown symptoms yet. But it's, it's coming in on time and it's something we need to explore. So that's kind of a general outline of some of the things I'm gonna be talking about uh, because they have implications for us through June. So let's just talk about the weather because the weather bats last in our business and it certainly has been strange this year. It's been cool in 2019. So I, I looked into our, our crop, crop weather reports that come out. I haven't been able to update this as of this morning because the report just came out. Uh, so this is based on last week at this time. So up to June 17th in 2019, our growing degree days have ranged from 63% to 89% across the province with the majority of areas below 80%. That is big news for beans. That's cold. And, uh, 80% of GDD makes a big difference in terms of how quickly those beans are gonna grow. Um, let's compare it to past years. Last year, June 17th, 2018, we were ranging in growing degree days from 107 to 
across the province and all areas were above 100 percent so it was a lot warmer and that's reflected in our growth stages and i'm going to talk about that in a minute and also we, let's look at 2017. I'd, I'd like to look at all three years because these three years really to me represent a, a real change in weather conditions in our soybean growing area. In 2017, it was a little cooler again, growing degree days ranged from 81 to 109% with most areas above 95%. So 2017 was relatively in the normal ball, ballpark. There's always a lot of variation. 2018 was hot and 2019 has been cool. And it's affected us out there, both in terms of what growth stage we're in, but also in terms of what our weed growth is doing. 2019, it's been dry. Now, that being said, I know that in the Southwest in particular, there's been a big change since this last weather report that I used for this slide got issued. So the numbers now are a bit different in certain parts of the province, but overall, it's still been dry. So when we look at the data up into June 17th, Rainfall accumulation, accumulation across the province ranged from 25 to 119 percent, with the majority of areas below 70 percent. Contrast that to 2018, we were at 22 percent to 230 33 percent total rainfall accumulation, with the majority of areas above 70 percent. 2018 wasn't wet, but it certainly was more moist than 2019 has been so far. And in 2017. We were in a drier situation. Rainfall accumulation ranged from 41 to 201 percent. Most of the province was above 60 percent in terms of total rainfall accumulation, 60 percent of normal. So it's been dry. It's changed in a few areas just very recently, but still it's been really dry. And between the coolness and the dryness, we've had a lot of things impacted. Uh, and, and all the things I'm going to talk to from now on really can be related back to the weather to an extent. Um, the, these two phenomena have had a lot of impact. Not only that, I think a lot of the things we're dealing with now, a lot of the issues that have come up over the last three years have really represented a change in the weather from 2016, a real change towards a much drier cycle, temperatures bouncing all over the place. And overall, it's been drier these last three years. We've had more evaporation then we've had rainfall precipitation. So our evaporation of water off our soils is outpacing how much water is infiltrating our soils. And that's an important point that I, I want you to hold on to for later. So growth stage wise, when we look at the reports out east here, we're ranging from BC, which is uh, basically our unifoliate leaves open up to just above v3 which is the third trifoliate so here we have vc we have v1 that's when our first trifoliate leaf comes out and unfurls itself and in the next picture th these all come from the manitoba pulse and soybean growers uh soybean staging guide in the third picture we have a plant that's actually got four trifoliates out here we have two unfolded trifoliates in some field and we have a third one that's just starting to unfold out west, we're backed up a bit. We're ranging between VC and V1. So a first trifoliate leaf and a second one, the plant is working on this. So that's where we're at right now. Contrast that with 2018 when it was a lot warmer and somewhat more moist. Uh, right now, uh, as of today, out, out, out here, we were actually going reproductive already. We had started R1. Uh, last year at this time out west, we were in V4, so we were all working on our fourth trifoliate. By next week out west, we had gone reproductive as well. So we are a good growth stage to two growth stages behind where we usually are um, and where we were last year in particular. So that's significant, and we're going to talk about that in the herbicide section. I have concerns. Given the weather that we're getting, the fact that it seems like summer has arrived, we are going to see these plants really speed up in their development. Soybeans are very flexible plants, and they're also they've got a, a, a short night trigger, right? They've got a they've got a, a when the shortest night of the year comes along, they get in the mood to reproduce, and we have to keep that in mind because those two factors are going to influence how quickly they develop, and it's going to impact what we have left for herbicide selection. But we'll get into that in a minute. So one of the things we should be doing now 
is plant stand evaluation. We recommend four weeks after planting that we start looking at our plant stands. Um, and that's something that I just think is critical. I can't overemphasize plant stand evaluation in soybeans. I think if you're gonna, if you're gonna look at them at all, look at them now. Uh, why? Because of money. Uh, half of the cost of growing these things is the seed and all the inputs that come with it. Um, and we need to do a good job of this. It's critical, but it's a lot of money. So this is our chance to evaluate the job of seeding we've done. This is our chance to see whether we need to make adjustments. Are we doing things that are ruining our seed? Are we seeding too deep? Are we seeding too shallow? Um, have we got dry seed issues? Were there something things going on? And it's a chance to look at seedling health, evaluate whether we think we're getting something out of our seed treatments, look at how our seedlings are doing, and it gives us a chance to see everything else that's going on, like the cutworms, like the IDC, things I'm gonna talk about later on in this presentation. So it's just absolutely important that we do this. How do we do this? Um, here's a picture of me and my little booties out in the field, get a hula hoop. I mean, it's just, I don't go out to do plant stand evaluations without my hula hoop uh, because you can do so much at once and you can get a quick count. I like to make my hula hoop 28 and a quarter inches uh, the reason I like to do that is because it gives me an easy multiplier. Whenever I go out to a field this time of year, I try and have my hula hoop with me and I go out and throw it around so I can give the grower some feedback on his plant population. What are we shooting for with plant populations? Generally, we're shooting for that 130 live plants per acre to 160 live plants per acre. It really kind of depends on your seed survival, it depends on your target. Whatever your target is, you should be seeing whether you're hitting your target. Um, when do we get concerned? We're gonna talk about that in a bit, but certainly when we're down to 100,000 plants, as long as everything else in the season goes right, I'm still feeling pretty good about it. Once we get below that, we have some concerns. So here's just a chart, conversion factors, and this is why I like the 28 and a quarter, because my multiplier is 10,000. I see 13 plants inside my hula hoop, I've got 130,000 live plants per acre. Makes my life really easy. I encourage you to go buy a hula hoop. Uh, it's made a big difference in my ability to provide clients with quality feedback. So here's a shot of a hula hoop with about 10 plants in it. So 102 plant, uh, plants per acre, 102,000 live plants per acre. This is kind of, this is an important point for me in terms of evaluating plant stands. When we get below the 100,000, um, I, soybeans can still compensate a great deal. If we look at the American crop insurance data in particular, they suggest that even at 75,000 live plants per acre, provided that everything else goes right, yield losses might only be in about that 15% below normal range. But this is kind of below this kind of picture, below this kind of view through the hula hoop, I start getting concerned. Uh, and I think a grower should be concerned unless they made this their target, if this is what they're getting, they should be concerned about how good of a job they're doing. They likely wanted more than that. This is a little too much. So this is 200,000 plants per acre. According to our research, this is overdoing it a bit. So there's about 20 plants in this hula hoop. They're fairly well distributed, which is nice, but it's a little on the thick side. And this is ridiculous. This is 1.2 million. I put this in here simply because I have this slide. Dennis Lang did this. Uh, this is where somebody overseeded a few different times but clearly this is way too many. Remember for wide rows, the hula hoop doesn't work. Uh, most of my clients are growing narrow rows with air drills, but I do have planter clients, uh, especially people growing corn and sunflower as well. With those, we wanna measure a length of row and count our plants. We wanna do the thousandth of an acre measurement. And this is just a, a, a chart showing that. With narrow row below 15 inch, I use the hula hoop. Above 15 inch, I use the tape measure but this is really something we should be doing. As well, when we're out there, like I said, it's a chance to evaluate plant health. What a great opportunity. And the hula hoop really focuses your, your vision and helps you search for these sick plants. So we've got a variety of root rots going on now. That's what we're gonna see now for disease. It's gonna be our root rots that we're observing. Uh, given the relatively dry and, and relatively cool conditions, I haven't seen too much of this, but certainly we should be on the lookout for it. Um, the one thing, though, is it's hard to tell, tell them apart. Uh, there are four major culprits that we're looking at. Pythium, 
our phytophthora, which is specific to soy, relatively specific to soy, not entirely, but for, for practical sake, I'd say it's specific, Rhizoctonia and Fusarium. Those are our likely candidates. It's going to be one or more of them that's causing our problem. Uh, this is a chance to evaluate the effectiveness of our seed treatments. It's a chance to see whether or not we're going to have problems and, and we can reasonably expect greater stand losses as the season goes on. Remember our diagnostic lab? There's an opportunity. I encourage people, if they are finding plants that are, uh, that are damping off, uh, that, they, that they try to get samples to our lab through, through our network of offices so they can try and get an idea of which particular fungus is giving them a problem. They do vary depending on weather conditions each year in terms of which ones are active, uh, but it is important to follow up and try and get a sense of which species you're dealing with. Uh, so it's something we can evaluate. It's certainly very important. Okay, the other thing I wanna talk about, cutworms. So here's a picture of the crime scene. This is some, a picture that I got from, uh, from, Kristen, from Cassandra Tachik at Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers. Uh, there we have the typical cutoff plants. That's what a lot of people associate with the damage from cutworms and soy, uh, but it's not entirely that. There are a number of things that can be happening. Notice this wilted plant over here. That's, a, that's another type of symptom. But the cutoff plants is what usually gets people's attention. So that's our crime scene. So we need to do a search for clues with cutworms. Now, I'll say with cutworms and soy, we've always known that they eat soy. They eat a lot of things. But we've, we've never gotten too worked up about it. Uh, damage has been sporadic. As I said at the start of this presentation, this year was unprecedented. I've never seen so much soy affected by cutworms in my service area. I have had clients have to reseed fields from cutworms in the past, but never like this year. So it's something that's quite stood out for me. So we have to start scouting in May when we expect the plants to begin emerging. Uh, cutworms, depending on the species, can feed for 65 to 87 days, technically. Uh, the most common thing I hear from growers is where did the plants go? And unfortunately, by the time you get to that point where from the road, the missing plants are really obvious, you've got a big bald spot in the field, a lot of damage has been potentially done. So uh, that's often what catches people's attention. We've got so many acres and we've got so much to do at this time of year but often the horse is a little bit out of the barn at this time. And often I get that statement when we're getting towards the end of when we can do something about the cutworms. But we need to look for notched, gouged, shot hole plant tissue, leaves that are cut up. Wilted plants can be a sign because the stem's been, been part, at least partially snipped. Some of the vascular tissue's been compromised. Obviously clipped stems as in the picture. Seed row gaps, the cutworms like to work their way down a row sometimes. And then of course cutworms. I really like to be able to actually find some and try and sample the field well if I can, so I can evaluate where they are in the life cycle and what species they are. So we need to do a good job of searching for clues. Unfortunately, sometimes it's really a matter of big bold spots in the field, which like I say, it's a little on the late side then. So finding the suspects, this can be sometimes a bit challenging. Uh, digging around the suspect areas, digging around the base of the plants, uh, is, is the way we start with this. Sifting the soil through my fingers can work sometimes. Um, I like to scoop it into a container and give it a shake, dig around the plant, get some soil in there, shake it up, and I can start picking them out. Cutworms vary. They can be just below the soil surface up to four inches deep. Uh, it's impacted by the, the dryness of the soil. It's impacted by how big or how small they are. Um, often people say dig deeper in the heat. Um, sometimes really it's dig deeper because the soil's dry. Um, revisiting the field when it's cool sometimes helps finding them. But if you can find the suspects, uh, I think that really helps in terms of making an accurate call on whether or not an insecticide is justified with these guys. So evaluating your threat with cutworms, identifying the species of cutworm is important. Uh, our two biggies are, are dingy and red-backed. Uh, we do have dark-sided as well. Um, these cutworms have different life cycles. Um, they overwinter differently. And so they will grow at different rates and they'll finish their feeding at different times. And that's something we need to be aware of. I'm not gonna get into all the details and you've had past presentations from John Gavlosky that have provided you a lot of information. But knowing your cutworm, knowing your dominant species is important because that'll help you assess 
how long your field might be under threat. Um, and there have been some surprises, pale western cutworm, which is not unheard of in the province, uh, but uh, which is fairly rare, has shown up this year. Uh, it was noted in uh, the last week's crop pest report that John Gevlowski and uh, his team put out. And that's an underground feeder. It's a lot harder to control. It snips under the ground and it's harder to control with insecticides. So there have been a few surprises. We need to know the species and then it's an evaluation of size. Uh, and that's really important in terms of assessing whether the threat's already over, whether we're too late in assessing our field, or whether we've still got potential for ongoing damage. The smaller the cutworm, the longer it's going to feed, because it's waiting until it's, it starts its, its pupation. Uh, cutworms longer than an inch are usually near the end of their feeding cycle. So looking at cutworm size is important. I've got some pictures here. So here's a really big fella. A uh, client sent me this picture. Um, he's already, you know, you measure him out. He's working on more than an inch and a half. This one is close to being done feeding. However, in the same field, the client found redbacks that are in a very different position. So we have ones here that are un at an inch. We've got a really big one here that's over an inch. And then we've got a small one here. Uh, one thing this year that my clients have been noticing and I've been noticing is that uh, there has been a wide variation in cutworm size within species. So um, uh, evaluation of cutworm size has been, I think, a little more challenging this year. And that's not the first year that's happened. But this year, we are finding a wider range of sizes. Getting a handle on where you're at with cutworm size requires, I think, fairly thorough sampling so you can assess how much of the threat is left. Um, that's been a little bit more challenging this year, I've personally found, than in the past, and it requires more digging and more sifting. I personally am really biased towards finding these guys. Uh, assessing the field just on damage makes me a little uncomfortable because I want to know where I am with my cutworm life cycle, particularly when I'm making spray calls later on in the season. So making a decision with cutworms, the nominal threshold for soybeans, we don't have a heavily researched threshold. We have a nominal threshold that's been based on informed scientific opinion. One or more cutworms that are less than 2.5 centimeters in length per meter of row is one way that we evaluate it, or we look for 20% of the soybean plants cut off. Um, so it's a, it's a two-sided sort of uh, threshold. We're either looking at the number of cutworms and their size, or we're looking at the amount of damage. Um, Remember that damage is often patchy. Uh, scouting needs to be thorough. I've had a number of situations this year where uh, uh, the, the, the big patch of damage was kind of over the hill and you couldn't see it from the driveway. And so it got discovered relatively late in the game because it was, it was over there, not kind of where people were walking. So it can be patchy. Scouting needs to be more thorough than I think sometimes we're doing, especially if we want to evaluate where the cutworms are in their molts and how big they are. Um, we have had seen more a variation in size. And then this year, one of the things that has let my clients down is making assumptions based on the soil type, the field topography, the crop type, past tillage efforts. That's led to errors. And, and what people are trying to do, and it's understandable, there's so much to do. They're trying to rationalize their time and rationalize how many fields they're scouting because they can't just walk every acre. And so we, we start to make assumptions. We go, well, they're going to probably be worse in the lighter, sandier soil than they will be in the clays. They'll probably uh, be worse, they, they, you know, they, they might be worse on the hilltops rather than the low spots. Um, I've had a number of clients who have see, had low plant populations on hilltops in clay soils and assumed that it was lack of moisture causing a lack of germination of the seed. And it turns out that it was actually cutworms. Crop type, this is where soybeans have kind of gotten hit. Uh, people have looked at their sunflowers. They've gone to kind of the crops where they've been worried about them in the past. Um, but this year it was soybeans turn in a lot of cases. And we just didn't think of soybeans as a crop that has cutworms. Uh, and then another thing is past tillage efforts where people have kind of tried to look at these things as clues to try and rationalize their efforts. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some correlations between the things people are observing. And I encourage people to try and make connections between the way they've prepared a field or the, the, the condition of that field, maybe in terms of trying to help them predict where the cutworms will be. 
But this year we have found that when we've just made assumptions and said, I'm not going to scout that field because I don't think it has the right crop or the right soil, the right characteristics for cutworms, that's the one that's had cutworms. So we have to be careful when we're trying to rationalize how much scouting we're going to do. So moving on to weed control, um, this is kind of our standard slide on the weed control that Dennis and I put up. Whoop, I think it's got a timer on it. We put this one up like religion, control weeds early, soybeans are poor competitors. We really want to keep our soybeans clean uh, during that, from, from before emergence through to the third trifoliate. Uh, don't cut your rates. We've had calls from people who have been thinking about doing with their second application, they've been thinking about cutting some rates and, and splitting applications. We don't want to cut our rates on product. We need to make sure that we're, we're killing what we're hitting. Uh, knowing your weeds, doing a good weed inventory, that's been a challenge this year. We've had a lack of weeds. I have clients who have done a first application and I'd say that more than half the acres out my way here, we're really wondering if we need a second application. Uh, because we're scouting and we're not finding a whole lot that we're worried about. I have other clients who didn't have any weeds in the start and have yet to do an application of, of, of glyphosate. And so again, a lot of scouting is going on and we're asking ourselves that question. Important to scout your fields before and after spraying. And I'll talk about that in a minute in terms of why that's important. It's important just to evaluate how good of a job was done, but there are other issues. And then watch for weeds not controlled by that first application because, again, we have some growing issues with our herbicides and resistance. So that's kind of the standard thing we say. But remember the weather this year. I think that's what's, that's what's complicating this weed control picture. It's been cool. We've gone over this before. And for the most part, up until recently in most areas and out here continuing, it's been dry. So right now we're vegetative and this is going to highlight one of my big concerns right now we're vegetative and we talked about the stages that we're out at out here we're kind of working on third trifoliate or v3 out west we've got vc v1 first trifoliate but we've we've had the shortest night of the year these are very flexible plants some areas have gotten moisture and boy it's warming up so i think things are going to move along quickly now and it can catch us off guard. If we're looking at second pass applications, remember some of the broadleaf chemistries we really like to use, they're done after third trifoliate in terms of label, rec label the, what the label says. So some of them cut off relatively early in our vegetative stage, some of the products we really like. And even with glyphosate and with things like Extend, we've got limits on how far we can spray them. So last year, out here in Bozizier, at this moment, we were already in R1. We were beginning bloom. So our reproductive stages, R1 is the plant has at least one open flower at any node. So that's R1. R2, we've got an open flower at, at one of the two uppermost nodes on the main stem. And R3, we've got a pod that's at least at one pod that's at least a quarter inch long at one of the four uppermost nodes on the main stem. These reproductive stages are going to come on really quickly. Um, and when you look at the record, when you look at the past crop reports that we've done over the years, it's surprising how quickly we shift gears from relatively small vegetative states to reproductive states. Um, I have seen years when we've gotten more than six trifoliates on the plant before we've gone reproductive. And I've seen years where we barely made three and we're gone. And, and things are starting to happen in the second trifoliate. The plants really don't like to flower before the third trifoliate. They find it stressful, but they're going to do what they feel they need to do. So we could very quickly not have stage for some of the products we want to use. Extend goes, goes up to R1. It, it's, it's R1 is kind of the last stage that you use at the Extend products. Glyphosate, they say through bloom, it's, it's R2 is the last stage that you're using that product. So even with our glyphosates, we could get into a situation where we're getting towards the end of that staginess. So please keep an eye on that because it's going to change fast uh, based on what I'm seeing for weather. Uh, remember that this plant just doesn't, the kind of varieties we grow in this part of the country, 
the plant soybeans do a lot of vegetative growing and a lot of reproducing all at the same time. Most of the plant's mass and size in terms of its nodes and its leaves happens as it's going reproductive. Everything happens kind of at once, once we get into the beginning of July. And so that can really affect us in terms of what we can use for products as we try and make these decisions on this, on this, on this final pass of weed control. One of the things I am concerned about is late passes of products containing dicamba. Uh, the manufacturer, as well as Dennis and myself and Amir, really like to see people use products like Extend as a as a as a post a pre-emergent or an early post-emergent when a lot of vulnerable crops surrounding the field aren't up or aren't very aren't aren't emerging. Um, but there may be a temptation because of what you can get for weed control with this product on your extend beans to use it late as a final application to solve some problems. Um, this is part of the challenge that they've had in the US where people have been using the product relatively late towards the end of the spray window uh, as a way to clean up problems, particularly with things like glyphosate resistant weeds down south and dicamba can drift. Uh, there are a lot of good things you can do to minimize that, but you've got a lot of sensitive crops around you. I mean, years ago when we used dicamba out here, we grew a lot of cereals. Nowadays, half the acres around me are seeded into soy every year. And that most of that is still just Roundup Ready soy. It's not extended yet. So that means there's a lot of vulnerable crop that, I, that someone could drift dicamba on. So I really am not a big fan of trying to use dicamba containing products as that second app, but I think there could be a temptation out there because of the problems it could solve. So be careful. Also, as we rush to get this done, uh, let's make sure that we know what crop is beside us. Uh, Roundup Ready soybeans look an awful lot like conventional soybeans, extend soybeans, conventional soybeans, Roundup Ready soybeans all look the same. And don't forget, if you're in the right area of the province, dry beans from a distance from the cab of the sprayer, half a mile away, dry beans look like soybeans. And they're not going to take well to glyphosate or dicamba containing products being drifted onto them. Another big thing to watch out for, and this was reinforced to me yesterday as I worked on a, on a potential issue with this, glyphosate resistant weeds. That's why we talk about doing a lot of post spraying scouting and soybeans. Um, we are seeing more and more of this in my area. We're seeing it across the province. I think that the kind of concern about it dies down. We get busy and we forget, uh, but it is developing. And so it's something to keep in mind. And I want to show you a picture of this giant ragweed because I think to some extent with 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 this issue of glyphosate resistant weeds it's not until you you experience it right in your face with a client or on your own farm that you that it 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 stays in your mind and it becomes i think the more urgent priority that it should be and this was my epiphany when this seven foot giant greeted me and i went wow this is a real thing and it's happening in my backyard it's happening here and it is happening here and it's happening all over. Um, it's starting, it's starting. Um, and I don't wanna panic anybody, that's not my point. I think there's a lot of things we can do. There's a lot of good management things. Uh, we, we can address this issue. And I think soybeans is a crop where we should really be watching. It's one of the crops where of course, because we're using glyphosate, we're going to pick up on this problem. Early scouting is absolutely key. Most of the fields that I get called to where we're assessing these things and determining whether or not we have a problem with glyphosate resistance are situations where it wasn't noticed soon enough um, and it's become a bigger problem than it needed to be. And, and then recovering from the situation while it's completely doable, you can do something about this, has become more complicated. So just a reminder out there, I think it's really important. Okay, iron chlorosis. This is a shot that Lionel sent me. Um, it looks like Lionel, uh, iron chlorosis from here. Uh, yellowing at this point in the year is very typical of beans and there's a number of reasons for it. We have to remember that right now our cotyledon leaves, which have been the food source for the seedling, are playing out. 
that's why we're seeing some of this stuff. And there's two big things that are happening. One of them is that the plants have been living off the nitrogen in the cotyledons, which they've degraded, the nitrogen's gone, and the plant is now going to start up nitrogen fixation. Uh, the plant needs to feel a little bit of nitrogen stress to get the hint to do that. So that can be happening. That produces more of a generalized yellowing of the plant. But the other thing that happens now is the cotyledons are also empty of iron. And the plant, given the size of it, and this year, given the size of them, because they are a little on the smaller side, they are challenged with getting iron out of the soil for a period of time. This is, a, this is generally a temporary thing, depending on a number of factors. And so we see this yellowing. But from this view, from I'm parked in the driveway looking at this through the cab of my truck, I don't know what exactly this is. We've got to enter the field, and we're looking for this. Interveinal chlorosis. The, the veins stay dark green, the areas in between the veins yellow. Interveinal leaf yellowing is, is the sign of IDC. Um, we can see if it gets bad, we can see necrotic leaf tissue. Leaf tissue can be destroyed. It begins as generalized yellowing though, but it quickly transitions really, really fast. This is this has begun. It's more, it seems to be more extensive out west at this point than it is out here where I am. I am though finding, however, that I have fields that are quite affected and other ones that are still relatively unaffected. Now, um, the things to keep in mind about IDC, the in intensity, the timing, and the longevity varies year to year. And I think we're over the last three years, we're really learning this. 2017 was bad. 2018 varied depending where you were. Out my way, it wasn't nearly as bad. 2019, we're still trying to figure this one out. It can catch us unprepared. We can go through years where it's a flash in the pan and we're not that worried about it. And then we can have years where it's bad. Uh, patient and close observation is required with this. Um, and we have to uh, do some evaluation. We have to keep an eye on it. Um, and a lot of people ask, can it affect yield? Sure, it can. Uh, the NDSU research, where they've done an awful lot of work in this, they suggest that if it, if if the IDC, a significant IDC persists into the fifth to sixth trifoliate, you're going to look, you're going to see a yield reduction that you're really going to pick up on. So we're hoping that this is something that comes and goes in relatively quick order. But I think what we've been experiencing over the last three years is an eye opener in terms of what causes this and what's changing in our environment year to year. So in the case of IDC, uh, when we have wet soils, uh, but not, not necessarily hugely wet, but when our soils are wet and we have high levels of carbonates in our soils and high levels of soluble salts, the young plants have trouble taking up iron. Uh, generally, fields with carbonate levels below 1% and salts that are, that are uh, below 0.3 have a low risk. And fields that have carbonate levels that are above 5% and salt levels that are above 1 have a high risk. Um, and uh, the MPSG has put out a good soybean fertility fact sheet. And in there, they have this risk chart, which I find useful. Because I'm still convinced that the biggest thing we can do about this problem is evaluating our risk and making good variety selections. And I'll get, that in, I'll get into that in a minute in terms of prioritizing where IDC is on our list of things we're looking for in a variety. Um, but what I think we're discovering too is carbonate level, we measure that in our soil test, it generally our carbonate level is what our carbonate level is. But what's been changing in our environment has been our soluble salts. I said earlier on, over the last three years, generally, we've been having a lot more evaporation off the surface of our soils than penetration of rainfall, than percolation of rainfall into our soils. And I think that one of the things that we're really getting in touch with is the fact that our salinity moves around, our salinity levels in our topsoils fluctuate. We like to talk about that salty spot in the field or that salty field, that, that saline field. But it's not that simple. Things change, salinity changes. What we have out here where I am is we have a situation where evaporation is one of the ways we get rid of water because we have real problems with that generally. And we do a lot of things that cause evaporations in our soil. And, and salinity builds as that evaporation happens. 
but usually most of the time we get significant rainfalls in May and June that also reverse the evaporation and push the push those salts down. And we often don't get so dry that we stop evaporation altogether because the soil's dry enough that there's no evaporation going on. So we tend to evaporate water fairly readily through the growing season. Our correction is the big flush the next spring that helps rebalance our salinity to an extent and lowers the likelihood that we'll have symptomology. But in the last three years, we haven't been getting those types of patterns. Um, we have not had the big, big rainfalls in the spring, uh, the, the long three-day soakers in particular that really fix this up when it comes to salinity. It's got, those kind of things can cause other problems for us, but we haven't had that. And my feeling is salinity levels have increased and they haven't gone through that cycle of decreasing again all that readily. So we'll see where it goes this year. We'll see how, how, much, how much salinity has changed. Um, it's sounding like our soil specialists are getting calls in a number of crops on damage from higher levels of salinity than were expected. So we'll see where it goes. But I think that's something we have to keep in mind. The last three years have not been good to us in terms of helping us with salinity. And in areas like where I am, we are prone towards having salinity issues in our soils, uh, particularly as, as we have more and more evaporation. So I think that's something that's contributing to some of the higher levels and more intense experiences we've had with IDC over the last few years. So what do we do? Well, patience. We have to be patient. Um, I think if you see the onset of symptoms, not looking at it for a week, once you've determined that it's IDC, is probably a good thing for your own sense of nerves and, and, and your own management uh, because come back in a week and reevaluate. Sometimes it only lasts a week. There are products, there are some chelates that can be applied in furrow at seeding. Uh, some of this is happening in the US. There's, there's research that's going on with this. It doesn't work with susceptible varieties, varieties that are really prone towards IDC, but there are, there are products, but they're, 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 they're seeding products. Um, I don't, I don't have high expectations of any foliar stuff correcting this problem. Um, this chelate uh, in furrow at seeding has been shown to be effective, uh, but it's not necessarily cheap at the rates you have to use. Uh, draw down soil nitrate can be an issue. High soil nitrates seem to amplify the problem if that's something that you're struggling with. But the big thing in my mind is variety selection for specific fields. Understanding your field risk for IDC and I think that's more than just characterizing the field once in time. I think that's a matter of knowing, soil testing that field before you're putting in beans and seeing where you're at on your, on your parameters, your carbonates and especially salinity. Um, and your second step, picking an appropriate variety for that field. Bear in mind, we do screen these varieties. Uh, all the varieties that go into the McBet testing program, they do get screened for IDC and they get rated. Dennis Lang leads this effort and does a tremendous amount of work getting this data ready for us to use. And there are ratings that are done from one to five with one being a, plant, a, a variety that stays completely green and is unaffected to five where the plant dies from the issue. And he also rates them as tolerant where the leaves for the very most part stay green to semi-tolerant where they turn yellow and then recover to susceptible where they become yellow and chlorotic, chlorotic and you have stunting of plants and you have leaf dieback. And there are ratings in Seed Manitoba. Here's a shot of, of that. This is uh, data is a little outdated, uh, but nonetheless, we should be looking at that. We should be characterizing our fields on, on, a, on a regular basis, uh, looking at that risk chart I showed you earlier, and then choosing varieties appropriately, uh, and trying to find use that as one of the parameters for our variety choice if we are having issues with this. And that urgency is going to vary over time in terms of if we're having issues. Um, these last three years have not been kind. Uh, 2017 in particular, 2019 we'll see. We've gone through periods of time though where it's been a relatively low concern. So there are things we can do. I still think variety choice uh, and knowing our field's capability for having this problem are really key. Anyways, that's all that I had, Lionel. So I'll hand it back to you. Great, Terry. Um, 
I'll check with Lori first to see if we have any questions for you. No, I don't have any questions. Okay, well, I've gotten a couple here. So the first one I got was, uh, how late can you go with the glyphosate application for your second application? Uh, I guess the, the, the crop is, is filling in fast, so they're wondering how, how late they can go uh, with that second application. Well, the, the label says through flowering. And we take that as the R2 growth stage is, is the is the last point at which you can be applying it. Okay. And another question is, uh, okay, so you you've been talking about uh, like a change in daylight time and the plants maybe going into reproductive stage uh, quicker than norm or probably normal time period, but. Uh, the plants are going to be shorter. So what does that mean for uh, overall growth of the plant and and potential yield later on? You know, I would say not a lot. Um, I My biggest concern about the phenomenon is really wrapped up in making sure that if we're doing herbicide work that we're conscious of the fact that growth stages could change. Soybeans are really, really flexible and their yield is determined over a fairly long period of time. So we've 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 been here before in some ways, not entirely the same scenario, but I temperature-wise, I've seen this before, and um, and I've seen these small plants and I've seen them strain to go reproductive, and it really depends on where we go from here, Lionel, in terms of what kind of growing season we have for the rest of the time. They can dr look dramatically different by the time we get to the end of August. So I would I'm not willing to co co correlate this kind of initial stress and strain and oddness with any sort of impact on yield yet. Um, I think that our biggest concerns right now are that we have a good plant population and that we're doing a good job of our weed control and that we're not adding further stress by doing herbicide applications that are way too late. What we get in the end is still yet to be determined. Okay, and I, I think does this make sense, Terry, that then maybe what we might see is some of those uh, lower pods are just going to be closer to the soil surface and it might make for a little bit uh, difficult harvest to get those bottom pods? Potentially, potentially, because when the plants get stressed and June is stressful for them because we've got herbicides, we've got puberty, we've got IDC, so the plants are stressed. And when they're stressed, the, dom the apical dominance of the top the top growing point, which control, which is really controlling the plant development, that tends to suffer. That tends to break down, and you do see some of the some of the lower nodes uh, of the plant, which wouldn't have borne branches in the past, actually start shooting out stems. And I've actually observed that in the field yesterday. I saw some plants doing that where they were stressed out, and so you start getting some odd things going on. And so there is potential for pods to be born on the lower nodes or even on the lower scale nodes on the stem that usually stay dormant. And then you can potentially have some of those lower pods. Um, we'll have to see how stressed out things get and uh, and whether or not the plant carries on. It Sometimes they initially start getting busy at those lower lower scale nodes, lower lower nodes, and then they, they kind of give up on it. And sometimes they bear pods there. So the potential is there for some low pods when we get cool temperatures and we get this kind of stress. But we, we don't know for sure yet, but it's it's an interesting observation and I've seen some indication that might be the case. Okay, well, uh, thanks, Terry. That was uh, a good uh, good presentation on the soybean crop and where it's kind of come from this year and where it's where it's going. So uh, thanks again. And uh, we'll definitely keep you in mind as we get later on into the growing season as to uh, how things are going. So uh, I guess with that, uh, I'll uh, go into uh, the crop update for uh, for this week and go through a few of the slides I've put together, a few of the things I've been seeing in the field. And I guess one of the things that we, Terry did mention is that we've uh, definitely uh, received some moisture in the western side of the province here that has been uh, uh, well accepted by most producers. I think uh, everybody was hoping for the rain and we, uh, we got some that's definitely gonna help us through uh, uh, 
get the plants through some of the stressful situations they were going through, whether it was drought conditions or herbicide applications or the insect damage that we've been having. So when you look at the, uh, the map here I have up, uh, basically showing that a lot of the uh, western side of the province, uh, anywhere between probably the 20 millimeters of rain to right up as high as 60 mils, uh, depending on the area you're in. So uh, definitely a welcome uh, rainfall over the past uh, past couple of weeks here and uh, still talking about maybe some more rainfall coming over, over the weekend here. Our uh, weekly map on uh, amount of rainfall throughout uh, the different areas as well as uh, the important numbers that we uh, seem to be watching a little bit more this year than other years is our growing degree days and our percentage of normal as well as our corn heat units and the percentage of normal and when we look at those uh, we see that we've uh, we've been increasing slowly on our, our, our growing degree days and our percent of normal and uh, with the next few days here uh, we could definitely see uh, uh, these numbers even getting better and uh, one of the keys for this one is is the evenings and how warm the evenings stay and if we can get uh, evening temperatures staying in the double digits, it'll definitely help our, our growing degree days and, and it'll definitely make a difference in, in these plants and, and, and their ability to uh, extend and grow a little bit more. Uh, when you look at our percentage of normal rainfall, we see a lot of the areas are uh, getting into the, uh, the high 70s, but you can also see the variability and uh, that's uh, probably due to some of the spotty thunderstorms that have been going through lately. Uh, reports of uh, uh, two days ago in the west of the low, uh, an inch and a half within, uh, within five to ten minutes. Uh, so again, we're getting those spotty showers or thunderstorms going through right now, and that's going to create a lot of differences uh, throughout the region. Good news, and Terry talked a bit about it, and we've been talking about it a lot lately, but uh, I think uh, I think our cutworm season is over, and I think our plants have outgrown uh, or are outgrowing our flea beetle issues. So I think uh, in general, we can, we can hopefully say uh, goodbye to these two pests for the year and uh, let the crop uh, grow. And uh, I think the biggest thing we need to do is, or hopefully we learned uh, a lot of things from these these pests this year and hopefully we can uh, use that information for for years to come and hopefully they're not going to be as uh, as as bad next year as they were this year some of the other things regarding weather uh, the you know recent high winds have uh, been causing some uh, some damage in the field and been getting some calls from producers and this was on the the pest uh, report that's prepared by John Gavlosky and uh, Tammy Jones and David Kaminsky, and and uh, this is just some wind damage to cereal crops, and this is an oat crop here. I think the big thing about this is uh, uh, a lot of times it can be mistaken for disease, it can be mistaken for uh, for chemical injury or even spray drift. So uh, definitely get out there and take a look at the uh, the damage before you uh, start uh, jumping into a fungicide application that may not be warranted yet. Look at the pea crop out there. Uh, it's probably been one of the bright uh, crops this spring so far. Uh, it's been able to manage the cool spring and most of the fields are looking right now to be average to a little bit above average. And I would think uh, probably some of them have started to flower and I think by the end of uh, this week, uh, it looks like we'll see, be seeing quite a few flowers out there. Uh, and it's also time to start scouting for disease uh, because uh, a lot of these crops uh, have been growing slow, but they're starting to fill in now. And if we might have any type of disease issues uh, with them, uh, that'll be something that uh, you wanna get good coverage in peas especially and get right to the base of the plant. So you wanna be uh, watching that and getting on them before uh, the crop fills in. Not gonna talk much about soybeans, but uh, because Terry did a great job, basically just showing where we're kind of sitting out here in that second to third trifoliate. And uh, this is a picture I took last year, uh, June the 27th. And uh, as Terry mentioned, we were flowering at, the, at this time. Uh, so a lot of difference uh, a year can make. 
cereal crops, uh, the majority of the cereal crops uh, are approaching flag leaf and some of the earlier ones uh, are in flag leaf already and uh, the real early ones are actually starting to head already. So uh, we've got a little bit of variance. We have lots of variance within the field and uh, it's that time of year again to go out there and start scouting for disease. And uh, it's something where uh, uh, it's gonna be a lot of variability within the field and something where we'll need to be needing to make a, a pretty keen assessment out and as we go. Picture to the right was, uh, was taken uh, this, this past week here. Uh, and it was uh, wheat that's just uh, just nicely starting to come out into head. Just a brief uh, look at some of the diseases that are out there. There's tan spot, uh, septoria in the spring wheats. Uh, there's some spot blotch that's been showing up. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on diseases because we're going to be fortunate for next week. We're going to have uh, Dave Kaminsky on, our, our pathologist, and he's going to go through a uh, wide range of uh, diseases that are out there that we should be watching for. He's going to look at timing, he's going to look at fungicide applications, and uh, basically uh, everything we wanted to know about disease uh, he's going to be covering next week. I did want to bring to your attention that uh, the Fusaria headlight maps are being produced, and this was the map for uh, June the 21st, and you can see the, the link is up there, so if you want to just go to that link and it'll give you the uh, the current map and it'll also give you the five-day outlook and when you look at what the map has changed from June the 21st where we were actually in extreme rating for, for Fusarium we have uh, since then uh, been have gone down to uh, a medium to high rating and again uh, you're gonna the map is a real good indicator but I think uh, with these thunder showers and, and storms that are going through it's going to be uh, a lot of ice, uh, more smaller areas where fusarium can be an issue more than other areas. So again, something to watch for. Another key would be a morning like this morning where we had a lot of uh, fog in the area where the plants stay wet for a long period of time. Again, uh, you know, promoting disease, not just fusarium, but a lot of the other diseases. I had this sent to me this week. Uh, and just wanted to put it up. It was uh, weed that I wasn't uh, very uh, wasn't very easy for me to identify until I was sent the picture of the seed head. And uh, this is wild licorice. Uh, it's uh, perennial. Uh, it'll grow in a lot of times. It's growing in haylands or in pasture or around uh, uh, bluffs or, or trees. And uh, the big thing with it, uh, it also be found quite a bit in ditches as well. But uh, one of the things that uh, this, as it gets to maturity, these uh, seed heads have lots of thorns on them and they do uh, catch onto your clothing and that's its key thing for spreading. So not just clothing, but as animals run through, they spread it that way as well. So uh, just a, a weed that I uh, hadn't seen for a while and I thought uh, I'd put it up just uh, because it was something that was brought to my attention this past week. Uh, from, uh, from a producer. A few other things that are going on, the Crop Diagnostic School is coming up. Uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, the dates for it are uh, July 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 16th, 17th, and 18th, but the 9th, 10th, and 11th days are full already. If you're interested in going to the Crop Diagnostic School, I would recommend that you book your spot Today, uh, it is filling up fast and it's definitely something where uh, you get an opportunity to meet a lot of industry people, you get an opportunity to meet a lot of our uh, guests that speak on Crop Talk and uh, it's just a, a good day of learning. So uh, something that uh, probably one of the, the, key, uh, the key events in, in the summer for in-field uh, demonstrations. Uh, also uh, going on is uh, uh, Martin Enns is putting on an organic uh, crop production field day and it's going to be in July the 16th and 17th at the research station in Carmen. So uh, if you're interested in organic production or if you're looking at some of the uh, some of the different uh, ways of uh, intercropping, um, um, manure management, uh, just uh, do the different uh, different some of the newer uh, newer things in farming. I guess uh, this is going to be available or this is going to be on 
on the 16th and 17th uh, in Carmen. For seasonal reports, uh, I think if anything right now, these are probably becoming more key at this time of year than, than at any other time, uh, mainly because of uh, the growing conditions we're experiencing right now. Make sure you keep up on the maps, uh, especially for fusarium and, and other diseases, as well as uh, they're, uh, we're getting into uh, uh, more of, uh, some of the, where some of the insect issues in canola might be coming in a, a problem. Uh, especially the diamondback and uh, Bertha armyworm. So, you know, definitely keep your, your eyes on that. Uh, weather maps are always great for just knowing what's going on. Our uh, group of extension specialists in Manitoba, if you're having any issues in the field, feel free to contact any of these people. Uh, there's the contact information and they'll be able to help you. And that'll be it for this week. So join us next week, July the 3rd, and uh, we're gonna look at disease identification and fungicide, fungicide timing with uh, David Kaminsky, our field crop pathologist. So uh, be kind of perfect timing as we get into uh, uh, a lot of fungicide application that'll be happening. So uh, join us next week.